virtual fantasy. We're just sitting there going, you know what would be really cool? Most sound designers have to come up with creative ways to get the sounds they want. Silence, your words betray your weakness. I cannot <laughs> work with this man. I get paid to play games eight hours a day. It's tedious and monotonous. Sir, I'm taking damage. Stop the presses. <laughs> get it fixed. It can't be work. It has to be your life. Over the past 15 years, their work has infiltrated deep inside the neural synapses of our society. For some, it serves as a few hours of diversion. For others, it's become an obsession. Either way, video games and their designers have altered the leisure landscape of our lives. That's due in part that the uh, games are becoming bigger and bigger productions. Originally in video games, you had one or two programmers in a garage. and They were doing the artwork, they were doing the music, they were doing everything. Uh, and they popped out these wonderful little games. These wonderful little games have turned into a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Now you look at big games, Donkey Kong Country or Zelda for N64, years and years in production, huge staffs of people, uh, very talented 3D graphics artists, uh, very talented programmers, musicians, composers, writers, editors. Uh, it's a big deal. It's very expensive to produce video games these days. It's an industry that made $7.5 billion last year in North America alone. It has matured into a serious business that rivals Hollywood. You know, whether it's TV, film, music, or video games, you're still trying to entertain people. You're trying to make people happy. They, the process yeah. of designing and making a video game is a fascinating, complex yeah. exercise that has attracted an eclectic group of people. Yeah, it, it sells it. Many of us in this industry crave a certain stress level, uh, and that's how we got here. If you're going to work 14, 16 hours a day, and you're going to be asked to work weekends, and you're going to basically lose your life for a year, two years, you have to be very passionate about what you're doing. It can't be work. It has to be your life. The companies range from third-party game developers such as Acclaim Studios in Austin, Texas. Kind of proof that you're doing something right if somebody from Hollywood goes, you know, we've heard of this little Turok thing you're doing there, and we kind of think uh, we like what uh, we hear. You know, can we uh, talk to you? To entertainment powerhouses like Lucas Arts of Star Wars fame, which has also made strong forays into the world of video games. It was so cool just to be able to write lines for Han Solo and Luke Skywalker and C-3PO. It was very cool. And there are the industry giants, companies like Nintendo that produce the actual game consoles as well as test and market the games. Five years ago we were just doing Donkey Kong and now we're doing over 30 products. The games are put together by teams ranging from creative director to the entry-level game tester. And it's all done on incredible deadlines, fueled by an endless stream of pizzas, sandwiches, and soft drinks. I mean, I hear medical students and people doing their internships just going, oh my god, these hours, and I'm like, been there. <laughs> so who are these passionate, eclectic people? Where do they come from? And how do they design a video game that will captivate the imaginations of millions of people? When we create game concepts, we're never at a loss for ideas. One of my jobs now as the creative director is to make sure that we're picking the strongest ideas, not only in terms of will the game be fun to play, but also is it the kind of game that the most people want to play. Dave Dinspear studied art in college and graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. I uh, <laughs> did a variety of freelance art jobs, which meant I starved or, you know, <laughs> was actually a waiter who called himself a freelance artist. Dinspear ended up in Houston, where he answered a newspaper ad for a job with a small game development company. Assuming I would be hired as an artist, uh, and I was in fact hired as a designer, and uh, when Turok began, I was put in charge of that from the design standpoint, and I quickly jumped into the role of project manager and lead designer. 
Turok is one of the most popular video games in the young history of this industry. It's known as a first-person shooter game, meaning the participant plays the game from the perspective of the lead character, Turok. There was no other comic book hero on the planet like Turok at the time. He was very unique. He was uh, kind of a Native American displaced from the Old West into this place called the Lost Land, which is kind of a bizarre nexus in time where uh, things from all over the universe and different galaxies get sucked into the Lost Land. The Lost Land, in actual fact, is in Houston, Texas, home of Acclaim Studios, one of the biggest game developers in the industry. These ordinary office hallways seem light years away from the fantastic and often bizarre worlds of the Turok series. That is, until Dave Dinspear's office. If we end up with a gecko or a chameleon in one of our games, you can pretty much guarantee that it's straight out of this office. This is like being in the park. He's like, oh, hey, <laughs> I'll go for a walk. Openly defying any number of management rules for the building, but it's uh, sanity maintenance. Even these worms right here are a major part of a, a concept that I've written. Here you see that they're kind of slow and non-threatening, but if you took those mandibles and made them eight inches across, all of a sudden you've got a serious threat for your video game. See him, he's looking for a spot to jump to now. That figures. I, I suppose I deserve that. We have such creative freedom doing what we do that any inspiration from any, if we want to take the wings of a beetle and the head of an ostrich and the feet of an alligator and put them onto a monster as big as a house, okay, we can do that. That's great, but you still want, you know, the look and the feeling and the impression of the creature to be one that's real. Five years ago, Acclaim went looking for a new video game hero. Their answer lay dormant within the tattered pages of a 1940s comic book series. When Acclaim acquired Valiant, part of the strategy was to take the comic book properties and brand them as video game properties. And uh, we decided to go with Turok as our initial effort because we felt that it had a lot that would translate well. Dinspear started with a 200-page Bible that outlined the world of Turok. What I wanted to do is I wanted to create the kind of three-dimensional game uh, that nobody had ever played before. And I wanted something lush and organic, something that would set the game apart visually. So in Turok, we had jungles and vines and trees. But a lush three-dimensional game environment requires tremendous amounts of computer memory. Five years ago, that was only available on personal computers. What really set it apart was that we were able to do that on a $200 game console that could plug directly into your TV and could turn on and work instantly. Up until that point, these games were only possible on a two or $3,000 PC. So uh, it opened up that sort of gaming experience to a much broader audience. Ahead of Dinspear lay two years of intense design, development, and testing before the Turok game would be ready to be unleashed on the video gaming public. One thing that we did do is we made a lot of sacrifices in order to make sure that the Turok stuff was as good as it is. You know, I slept on the couch outside my office five nights out of seven for about two years. The making of a video game hero when we return to Forbidden Places. Though video games and movies have fundamental differences in how they are experienced, the video game shares a common bond with its entertainment sibling. Greetings, Turok. I am Adon. The elders of the Lost Land, known as the Lazarus Concordance, have charged me with the task of guiding you on your quest to stop the Primogen. They both revolve around stories. As far as the story is concerned, it has all of the same um, structure. We still have a beginning, middle, and end, just like a film would have. Um, we still have interaction through dialogue. It's interactive and non-interactive. And so you have to cover for a lot more eventualities. In an unassuming building on the outskirts of San Francisco, project leader Gary Gaber and his team at LucasArts are creating a new game from one of the most prolific sources of video games, Star Wars. A story of two brothers, um, both stormtroopers that start off. They're part of this big galactic conflict. And um, the two brothers are part of the Empire, not part of the Rebellion. So they're actually on the side of the bad guys. 
Because this new game, Force Commander, has its origins in one of the most famous movie stories of all time, the story component of the game permeates all aspects of its development. I went to film school, actually New York University, and learned how to write scripts there. A typical movie script is something like 100, uh, 100 pages. That was just the cinematic and in-game part of our game. Unlike the viewer of a movie, the video game player has choices as to which direction the story will take. It's things you, um, you wouldn't account for in a movie script. It'd almost be like coming up with dialogue for all of the extras in a movie as well. Welcome to Coruscant. Would you like to go to the tourist center? Yes, please. Something like 2,000 other lines that happen within the game that are just game related. Things like um, a hover tank saying, Ready for attack orders, sir. Back at Acclaim Studios in Austin, Texas, the Turok series also relies on story to drive the gaming experience. It used to be kind of just kind of, oh, there's a story. Suffice it to say, you have to kill lots of stuff. Or suffice it to say, you have to save the world. Uh, nothing wrong with saving the world. I just like it to be a compelling experience. Nothing wrong with defeating a bad guy, as long as I think there's a good reason to. Navigating through textured worlds as Turok, the player's actions are motivated by a storyline set out at the beginning of each game. Your mission objectives are as follows. Destroy the, the video game has become increasingly story conscious. And defend it at all costs. I think our market's getting a little bit more sophisticated. Our consumer base is growing up a little bit, and they're finding that they enjoy actually having a story to be a part of, rather than just be completely mindless all the time. They don't necessarily want to stop doing what they're doing, but they like having reasons and having motivation and seeing the results of those actions play out in the form of a, a, a great story. The attention to story and structure in Turok and other games is an example of how the video game industry is evolving into an interactive medium as capable of setting their players' minds thinking as their hearts pumping. What, what, what? Man, I thought I was behind a corner. Once the basic story is established, the next step is to create the visual world into which characters and objects can be placed. It all starts out with uh, just you know pen and paper, and we uh, just have concept sketches. And uh, there's a general idea done in the design document of like what the creature needs to be, what he has to look like, and stuff like that. What the purpose he has to fill in the game, and then uh, it's the artist's uh, job to kind of just give that idea a form. The success of the original Turok has spawned two sequels. Dave Dinspear's team is currently creating the creatures who will inhabit the world of the second sequel. I'm not interested in, uh, in milking the sequel thing forever unless you can take it and do something different with it. One of the great things about this creature is we did have a creature from the last game to kind of start with. And so, you know, Ray's job is to make the next evolution. So he draws this bony spur and we go, cool. Despite the apparent whimsy of these fictional characters, there is a distinct and intelligent logic to their design. Sort of a human cranium. And I had an idea. I thought, well, if these guys are made of lava, Perhaps they should have, like, thermal vents in their bodies. So now he has these cool thermal vents that we then use as, as a, a kind of a, a weapon source. And then that evolves even more when you see the kind of creature that runs this society has more of these vents and the shape changes more and it becomes a larger, more horrific version. That's one of the main thrusts with this game is that we wanted the, the nature of many of the creatures to be new and to be twisted and to be more of a kind of the stuff that, you know, bad dreams are made of. But even the most twisted creatures in the Turok universe have their origins in the real world. The evil entity Oblivion can infest things that are both living and inanimate and twist them and mutate them into actual living, breathing, disgusting monstrosities. Help them. Even though the team still hasn't rendered all the action, they are working on a new monster that starts out as a helicopter. At the end of the first level, the player sees a, a police chopper actually get grabbed out of the sky by oblivion and pulled into this, like, nexus that it's emerging from, and then it spits it back out as this disgusting kind of twisted chopper creature. At that point, we really didn't even know what the chopper looked like, let alone what it was going to look like when it was possessed. So. Uh, there was a lot more sketches, but here's some of them. A uh, machine that's been possessed, and now it's floating around. It's got tentacles coming out of the bottom of it. Here's another one that uh, some sort of like 
cockroach type uh, cyclops thing. We asked Peter to uh, keep elements of the original chopper uh, in, in the design of the creature. So you see here that the, the, the mouth is actually what used to be the cockpit of, of the chopper. And these tentacles are growing out of the actual engines that the thing flies with. And if you, if you look on top, you can see the actual police lights and the entire tail structure intact. So it's as if uh, when Oblivion entered this thing, it just burst out through the shell. And now you have this disgusting, twisted, half mechanical and half organic creature that the player then has to shoot down in order to, to survive the level. Up against such nasty enemies, the development team had to provide the player with some powerful weapons. The team as a whole was really into making sure that our weapons were one of the, one of the pinnacles of the game experience was to create these outrageous over-the-top weapons that nobody had ever seen before. We had a, a, a nuke weapon that was just insane that would actually flatten an entire screen. We always go for very cheesy, um, kind of intense, but not, not really overly realistic kinds of weapons. It's boys with their toys is what it is. I mean, we're just sitting there going, you know what would be really cool? Once the characters and their weapons have been designed and drawn, the next step is to give them movement to animate them. Across the country in Redmond, Washington, at Nintendo, one of the giants of the industry, they are constantly working on new ways to improve the realism of character movement. Ah, and nowhere is this more important than in the sports game genre. Nintendo released a game based on NBA superstar Kobe Bryant. In any other basketball game you see, you, if you watch a slow motion replay and you see a character go up for a dunk, you're gonna see this kind of, they'll go to here, and then the character will float up, and then they'll go to here, and they'll float over, and then they'll float down, and they'll kind of stick on the rim, and you know, basically you're seeing a limited number of frames being displayed over and over and over. With the Kobe game, you'd actually see animation the entire time. So a slam dunk looks more, you know, slowly moving up every frame. You know, throughout this slow motion replay, every character on the screen is moving. To achieve this high level of realism in character movement, game developers went to the experts, actual basketball players. Reading movement from sensors attached to the athlete's body. The computer then plots those same coordinates into a 3D environment. After artists clothe and cover all the objects, the athlete's journey into the game world is amazingly seamless. There is none of this sliding, none of this popping. It's really rather haunting how lifelike they are. We've got a lot of detail on the screen here. We've got Back at Acclaim Studios in Austin, Texas, Turok's world is taking shape. In addition to character movement, the development team also works on the realism of the background environment. If you take a look at the game and you wander through the environment, you'll see that there's a lot of really subtle stuff that most games wouldn't have bothered putting in because, frankly, it would be a lot of work. To, to add things like, say, uh, bubbles coming up from the bottom of a lake or water dripping in a cave and actually causing splashes when it hits the ground. The hyper-reality of the new generation of video games requires the closest attention to colors, textures, and perspective. No detail is left to chance, not even the paint on a wall. What I'd like to see here is something a little bit, a little bit uh, lighter, uh, but also Something with more of a stucco look to it. Something a little bit, uh, a little bit rougher. Mm. Wow, let's see here. Oh, like that. Mm. Not so much. It's a little bit too, uh, too dark. Is there something lighter we could try in there? Hmm. Much better. Much better. Yeah, because what that does is it allows us to see the shadows and the light more, and it will also help the player uh, see enemies creeping about in there a little bit more. It's really not a question of creating a leading edge environment. It's the realism of the environment that keeps increasing. Uh, game makers have been making cityscapes and dungeons and castles and fantasy lands and forests for many years now. Uh, what we do is we push the level of detail and realism. Realism in the video game environment requires attention to the most subtle details. 
In a galaxy far, far away, just outside San Francisco, Lucas Arts employs one artist to work specifically on textures. Well, we're uh, with Marsha Thomas. She's, uh, she's our texture uh, person on the game. What she's done is singularly done all of the uh, planetary textures for all of our 10 different worlds. So she's done all, and, and what a texture is, is, is basically um, it's a, it's, it's a two-dimensional representation of three-dimensionality. It's, um, it's a way of showing terrain uh, in a very um, sort of artistic fashion. Every detail in a game takes up computer memory. The more memory a game requires, the slower it will play. If you actually did try to create a, a 3D mesh of rocks with every little intricate detail, it would just be way too huge. The game would be really slow. So I try to make it look three-dimensional um, just by painting it to look three-dimensional. Once Marcia and Gary agree that a rendering has the right look, she passes these backgrounds onto the next stage in the process. I turn them over to the level designers and they uh, map them onto their wireframe mesh. So it's like putting the skin on a, um, a skeleton. Creating worlds within worlds when we return to forbidden places. Deep beneath the surface of the lost land. Most of today's video games are made up of different levels, each more difficult than the last. Every level has a distinct theme. One might be a desert world, another might be an underground city. In a sense, these are games within a game. Each level has its own designer who is responsible for all the creative elements of that level. The level designers then take ownership of each of the levels. And, and what I mean by a level is, in our script, there are 23 parts that the player plays. Um, and in between those 23 parts, the story happens. I uh, take what the project leader has designed uh, for the game, and I basically build it from the ground up. So uh, he says, you know, I want a desert world with uh, sand troopers from the Star Wars universe in it that, uh, that you fight against. And I will go in and build the model for the terrain, place the units where I want them to be on the terrain, and um, give them artificial intelligence so they'll know to come attack you or to avoid you, that kind of thing. What the level designer will do is he'll come up with a look, uh, the idea of what actually goes on in each level. And at that point, I go back to the script and I change it to make it fit what they want to do, still keeping in mind the overall story so that uh, it doesn't become invalidated. Level designers come from a wide variety of backgrounds and bring with them an eclectic mix of skills. We typically uh, hire level designers from a lot of different disciplines. Um, one of those is architectural. Um, a, a very good architectural designer is great for doing indoor levels. As a level designer for Turok 3, Andy Schwallenberg will turn sketches on paper into 3D animation. I'm planning on the player coming up from this direction and when he gets to this corner, then I want this big tank to come around the corner. So I'll have the path start here. I want the tank to kind of go around this corner, and I want it to stop right about there. So now if I walk around this corner and come up to this police barricade, then you'll see that tank starting to roll around the corner. What's fun in a game, you really never know until you can move your character on the screen. You don't know until you can drive your car if this particular physics model is going to be fun for your game. Another vital consideration for the level designer is the placement of the camera. In other words, from what perspective the player sees the action. At LucasArts, Gary Gaber's team struggles with finding the most engaging camera angles for the Force Commander game. Completely. Every time I've played the game and, um, and showed it to people, um, we always get the feeling like it's great when you're in tactical view because you're down on the battlefield and it's a great sort of movie experience and everything's wonderful. Then you pull back up and it's like you've turned everything off. Gameplay was one of the main issues we attacked. Um, and the problem was this high camera worked just fine for a 2D game because you get such a nice view of the battlefield. But in a 3D game, what it tended to do was detach you from your units too much. They were little blobs on the screen that moved around. And so 
The main design decision and the main thrust of the new Force Commander was taking that camera, moving it down on the ground, and getting intimate with the vehicles, getting right up close to an ATST or right up close to a walker, and allowing you to feel like you were part of the action. Yep. So, so we can never get into this problem of being too high above the terrain. Unless, like, the unit is on top of it. It's an room. ongoing process to develop the game. Um, it is not something uh, where you can sit down um, and say, here's my conception, now I've got it. It's more like, here's my conception, I've put it down uh, in the computer, what can I do to make it better? The secret codes that create video game movement when we return to forbidden places. Once the creative team has developed the characters and their actions, the next challenge is to convert these visual elements into a program that a computer can understand. The program is what actually makes the game run. You know, it allows the character to move around on the screen. Again, you have to, if you look at a video game in abstract terms, it's really just a giant piece of math. The mathematical equations or code used by the computer are translated into visual actions on screen to which the players can respond. Code really is the programming language that drives the game. It's a, it, in the end, it's a series of what-if statements. What if the player presses the blue button? Should Mario jump up in the air? What do we do? What actions do we take when you press the blue button? Or we make a little hoo hoo sound, and we show the animation of Mario jumping up in the air. The programming is done typically in a language called C, uh, which is a, a language that you can read. It's in the English. Uh, but it's very terse, kind of cryptic terms. Every single movement or action in a video game must start as a piece of code in the computer language called C. Well, let's take uh, a game like Zelda, you know, where I'm, I'm in a town and Link is going to go up and speak with maybe someone, and the person has to get up out of his chair and he has to walk across the room and meet me. It's a very small portion of the overall game, and yet it may have taken a programmer days to write the piece of code. In the racing car metaphor, if computer code is the engine that drives the game, the programmer is the mechanic, and the creative team, collectively, is the driver. If the driver wants an adjustment in the handling of the car, he asks the mechanic, who in turn makes the necessary changes to the engine or computer code. So I'll work with the designer, and I'll give him the flexibility to just play with the engine, he'll say, oh, you know, he needs to take more damage when he falls off this, this platform here. So I can go ahead um, using this information and increase a few numbers based on the velocity that the character will be falling at when he hits the ground. And we can go ahead and set that up the way the designer wants it. Translating the action on screen into the C language the computer understands requires more than just typing in standard computer formulas. In terms of actual typing, it doesn't actually take that long to write something useful. It's the work you have to do before typing it. It's the actual thought behind it. It's the creation of the, of the actual logic that goes into the function that takes the time. There are plenty of people that have outdated perceptions about what sound is like in computer games. Sound is the final key in the gaming experience, the last sense that tugs the player along into this virtual reality. It is also one of the game characteristics that has most drastically evolved. Permission to engage the enemy, sir. Once in a while, I still get a response of, oh, you mean bloop, bloop, bleep, bleep, when I tell people that I write music for games. As a composer and sound development supervisor at Lucas Arts for the past nine years, Peter McConnell has seen the industry grow from its technological infancy. <laughs> I was here when, when it was bloop, bloop, bleep, bleep, when, when we still had to support a, a single PC speaker with a little square wave coming out of it. And, and, and part of the score was when, when, when the thing's on and when it's off, and that's, that's the music. <laughs> Sound is another element in the atmospheric world of the video game. The music helps to shape the emotion of the player, while sound effects punctuate movement and actions. In composing music for video games, sound designers like Peter face many of the same challenges that their film and TV counterparts do. It is very possible to annoy someone 
with, with, with music. And that's not what you want to do. What you want, you want the player to, to really feel more immersed in the experience as a result of the sonic part of it. Peter is now busy composing the music for the new Force Commander game. In doing so, he finds himself manipulating a piece of film history. I had a lot of trepidation about starting it, actually, because I run this idea by some people, and they were saying, are you sure that you want to put, you know, industrial drums under orchestral music? I mean, isn't that kind of sacrilegious? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I want to give it a shot. And, um, and what surprised me, actually, was how, how well it worked and how quickly and how little I had to change things to get it to work. It's like this. heavy it's got to be heavy I mean that's that's what our audience wants I think they want to feel pumped up they want to feel psyched they want to feel kind of militaristic after all it's a war simulation game so they want to feel bad it's it's tough to feel uh, bad to a symphony orchestra but you put a you put a good kick and snare under there and and uh, you can definitely get that across and and some heavy guitars and it it's pretty um, it's pretty unusual I'm pretty psyched about it Um, want to do some more of that? I don't know. At Acclaim Studios in Austin, Texas, Darren Mitchell works with Dave Dinspear to provide the perfect musical soundtrack to complement the lush worlds of the Turok series. David will come in and either hand me a script or say, this, the atmosphere here is dark, uh, you're in a cave, I know I want water dripping in the background. It's like, okay, and then I have to go from that. That's how much information I usually get. I think as long as the music conjures up a dark mood um, that has still got some excitement in it, even when it's soft, um, I think it will work for that game. Bringing a video game to life with rotten vegetables when we return to Forbidden Places. Working alongside the music composer, the sound effect artist works to thicken the aural landscape of the game. Accentuating the swing of an axe or a jump into water, the sound designer creates the acoustic landscape to the game's action. It's important to tie the player into the world through sound. You know, the ability to make something on the screen really appear to be part of that world. You have to be able to hear the person walking across wood versus walking across cement. Generally, we're brought in after they do an initial design phase. Um, we talk with the project managers and the designers on the team to kind of find out what their vision of how this game should sound. And we try to, you know, meld that with our vision. Mark Schaefgen is the sound effect artist at Acclaim Studios. He's responsible for designing the noises for the unusual characters in the Turok series. And a whole lot of good skin tearing to take you through the rest of the piece. And, when you, and then when you add in that big pig squeal, it all kind of comes together. The sound quality had to be if you went to see Turok in the movies. This is what it would sound like, fairly over the top, you know, not very realistic to real life, but realistic enough to make the environments believable, but to give the players the satisfaction that they really deserve. Sound effects are often employed to give a sense of realism to the manufactured worlds of the video game. Subtle nuances of real world noises that validate the player's involvement. With the technology we have, we can set an area in the game to play a certain set of sounds. And so as the player walks through this area, that random times, certain sound effects will kick in. Really good example of this in Turok 2 is if you go into level 3, which is the death marshes, um, you're in basically a swamp type area. You'll hear lots of crickets and frogs and owls and 
you know, lots of different creatures that would live in a swamp. You'll also, every once in a while, you hear a little skittering, like you just, you know, scared up some little critter. The challenge that sound designers face is the fact that many of the characters and worlds that they create for have little or no foundation in reality. The cerebral boar, for example, was, uh, uh, is a weapon from Turok 2 that fires a projectile that tracks on the brain waves of a creature. And once you acquire a lock, it will fly to them. It'll kind of zoom through the environment and smack them in the head and kind of um, messily dispatches them. Of course, I instantly thought of a dentist drill, you know, as it's boring into your skull because, you know, I had terrible childhood dentist memories. So I messed around with some dentist drill sounds and some other stuff and, and came with the impact of the sound. And of course, there's a firing of the sound and the weapon itself animates. With objects that are literally out of this world, Mark and his team of sound designers have to find real world sounds that will sound otherworldly to players. Most sound designers have to come up with creative ways to, to get the sounds they want. And a lot of times, everyday household items will serve up rather well. I went to the, uh, the local fruit store and got as, as much gushy type of uh, rotting fruit as I could and took it back home and just, you know, basically destroyed it. After that, you process it, manipulate it, do what you need to do to get it to sound exactly the way you want it. And it, you know, it served as blood, as, you know, flesh impacts when you got hit with bullets, you know, mixed with all, lots of other elements. Anything gushy, take flour and water and just kind of mix it together and, you know, things make weird noises. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't use, like, meat. Like, a lot of people will take meat and slap it around. I use fruit. <laughs> Medic. Smells good too. Okay, we need a garbage can. What else better to do? You have to work on that. Getting paid to play video games every day of the week when we return to Forbidden Places. A major new video game can cost millions of dollars to design and develop. Dozens of highly trained people, from artists to computer programmers, can spend months and sometimes even years on one single game. But there is another team of experts without whose efforts none of these games would ever make it into the home of video game players. They come from all walks of life. They are the lowest paid in the industry, but they may also be the most passionate. We have people with masters, we have people that barely made it out of high school. There's not uh, a job description that I can hand you and say, if you meet this criteria, you're going to be a good tester. Obviously, you have to have a passion for video games. In Redmond, Washington, Nintendo of America maintains a staff of over 200 game testers. <laughs> it all starts in an unassuming cubicle in an anonymous corner of the building. The contents, however, would leave most game players salivating. This is where all software, all pre-production software comes in to Nintendo. All starts right here. At 34, Michael Kelba is the product testing manager for Nintendo of America. His job is to oversee the testing of games submitted by third-party developers, such as Acclaim Studios and their Turok series. Basically, it comes in on uh, high-speed data transmission lines, and we, what we called burn, we burn it to these flash ROM carts. These flash ROM carts simulate what the production cartridges are uh, when you go to the store and buy one. The difference is uh, we can burn over and over and over again on these. So we, there's multiple uses and we use them all the time. So it could have basketball on it one day and Donkey Kong the next. With the creative and financial expense that developers have put towards these games, no risks are taken in protecting them from unsolicited examination. Not out of here. Luckily not. Nope. Want to keep it that way. <laughs> Hence the lock. <laughs> After it gets actually burnt to the cart itself, it gets checked out to the project coordinators, the actual individual responsible for the testing team itself. And then they actually check it out to the testers. So, and at that point, the whole process begins. 
expect to get it fixed. The process is actually the phase where each game is tested for bugs. Spawned by programming errors, these gremlins lay within layers of code, ready to wreak havoc upon the game player's experience. Um, a bug is uh, an event that you don't want to happen, basically. It's a problem in, in the program, and it can be a problem in the logic of what you've actually written. You know, if I fall off the cliff, then die, might not be what you actually want. You might want, if I fall off the cliff, then start swimming. With thousands of lines of code required to run a single game, it's not uncommon to find 20 to 30 bugs infesting the programming logic. Better leave them if the call is a god. The only way to uncover where the breakdowns occur is to play. So armed with a controller, each tester is assigned a certain level or aspect of the game, reporting back on any anomaly. I think the problem was you were at the very end of the court, and I was doing like a full court pass, and then um, it just locks up right away. From the outside, it would seem like a kid's fantasy. But it is work that requires a high tolerance for tedium. Objective testing is basically uh, functionality testing. The programmers tell the computer what to do, and we tell them whether it's actually doing it. It's tedious and monotonous, and the part of the job that makes it work, basically, uh, instead of just having fun playing games all day. At times, caused by something as minute as the omission of a punctuation mark, bugs can render a character's movement awkward or even freeze the game's progress. Anticipating every possible scenario, the methods the game testers employ to find bugs are sometimes as obscure as the bugs themselves. But a tester's job is to try to break your game. So they come up with some very bizarre combinations of button presses and lever moves and, and all these strange things that a normal game player wouldn't do. But often that uncovers a bigger problem. They're hidden, you know. They're, they're not there for us to find, you know, or they're not, you know, easily found. So when you find a good one, everyone kind of gathers around and, and makes a big deal out of it. With release dates always impending and the push to get a product approved, many times the testing department finds themselves as the bearers of bad news. There's that deadline that we have to hit, and from a corporate, corporate standpoint, everything is based on that approval date and that launch date. Um, as the product testing department finds more and more bugs, it, it infringes on making that date. In the case of Turok 2, a tester discovered an obscure bug that threatened to delay the game's release only a day before it was to be approved. We're about two days before approval, so we're in the process of uh, going through all the final check sheets. And this is just kind of a, a no-brainer bug. Nintendo discovered was that if you had two controllers plugged in and you unplugged one of them during gameplay, it would freeze up the game. Boom, it locks up and the whole room just... Uh, <laughs> stop the presses, <laughs> get it fixed. It was actually a very simple fix, but sometimes things that uh, appear to be small things can actually be symptoms of a larger problem, and that's why bug testing is so important. What are you looking for? However, video game testing is not just about finding bugs. It's also about making the game more fun. Our testers are our, our game players, and so they know what's fun. They know what makes a good game. Never bad. The repetitiveness of the work and the pressure to get all the bugs out so that a game can be approved can sometimes make playing video games for a living less fun than it sounds. We are taking serious hits, sir. The testers are beat. <laughs> Every testing area was kind of dark and, you know, they look like, uh, well, you could spot a tester a mile away. When a product comes to the end of the development cycle, it stops in the product testing department. And there's a date that you have to hit because if you miss it, you miss product launch. So it's not an uncommon situation for the testing department to work a lot of hours. It's a prerequisite. When I do interviews, they know before they come into this department that overtime is a crucial part of their, their job description. The collective success of video games in today's society can be attributed to a simple fact. They fulfill a fundamental need. You know, it's not really virtual reality that most of us look for in games. It's virtual fantasy. We live in the real world, it's not that much fun some of the time, so it's virtual fantasy and we want to be able to take 
behaviors that we know are appropriate from our experience in the real world and extrapolate on them in the game and make them even more fun or more scary if that's what we're trying to accomplish in that game.